Ray, consciousness is a hot subject in today's world, and I am just fascinated by the incredibly different views that some very smart people, scientists and philosophers, have about consciousness. If you just ask the simple question, what things are conscious, you get a whole bunch of different views. What's yours? Well, we certainly have disagreed. People don't agree on whether animals are conscious or not. Uh, and we will have these disagreements about computers. I don't think there's too many computers, or there's no computers today that people would seriously say are conscious. But it's my view that we will get to a point where computers will evidence the rich array of emotionally subtle uh, types of behavior that we see in human beings. And uh, they will claim to be conscious. And then it will be an issue as to whether or not they're conscious. Because it won't then be a polite philosophical debate because these entities will be very intelligent. They'll be participating in the debate. <laughs> and they'll have an impact. Uh, in my view, it's, it's well, first of all, we, fundamentally, it's not a scientific question. Uh, we, can we can talk scientifically about the neurological correlates of consciousness. But fundamentally, consciousness is this subjective experience that only I can uh, experience. I mean, I, I should only talk about it in, in first person terms. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been sufficiently socialized <laughs> to accept other people's <laughs> consciousness if they appear conscious, which they don't always. But uh, my own uh, consciousness is really only aware of itself. And it's, uh, there's no really way to measure the conscious uh, experiences of another entity. But if I go beyond that, I'd have to say it's an emergent property. We're not going to find a center of consciousness, I don't believe. The consciousness is in this particular module of the brain. I think an, an entity that is sufficiently complex and rich to embody the kind of phenomena that occur in the human brain uh, does emerge. Certainly, an emergent property is apparent consciousness. It, it will act in a way that's conscious. It will talk about its own consciousness and its own feelings, and will argue about it just the way you and I do. So you're bifurcating, in a sense, the, the, the consciousness into an apparent consciousness, which something acts as if it's conscious, and subjective consciousness, which is the internal feeling that I'm self-aware, which only I can have. And then we have to make a philosophical judgment, and which, which really stands outside of science, but I think is an important judgment to make. And I do make the judgment that apparently conscious entities are conscious. Uh, animals, some of them, uh, higher order animals, certainly s appear to be conscious. They may, you can say that's human centric because we say they're conscious when they're exhibiting human like emotions, like protecting their young or fear, uh, so we can empathize with them. But I do make the jump that if something is, uh, appears to be conscious, I'll accept that it, it, that it is conscious. And of course, we're hardwired to do that. We have this empathetic reactions. So you would say, of course, that human beings are conscious, consciousness is real, and that you can extend it down into the animal world. Uh, and, and when you get into non-biological uh, systems and complex enough, they're going to be indistinguishable from consciousness, leaving aside the question right. about, is there an internal experience? And I would accept that they're conscious. when, And uh, that'll be convenient anyway, because they'll get mad at me if I don't. So. <laughs> Now, John Searle has uh, famously had his so-called Chinese room. And in that, uh, it would appear that this person knew Chinese, yeah, so but all he was doing was following some rules. Right. So you have this person. Uh, he or she's got a rule book. It's just following these rules, gets a question in Chinese, and follows some procedure in the rule book, puts back an answer and is answering questions in Chinese. But the person apparently doesn't really know Chinese. And can we really say that this overall system is, is conscious? Uh, there's actually two different questions. Does, does, this, does this system understand Chinese? And is the system conscious? It kind of uh, merges these two questions. Uh, part of the problem. First of all, is the concept is not realistic. So people think of, oh, it's this person sitting with a little book. Maybe how, the book has maybe 100 pages. Maybe it's a 1,000-page book. Uh, this, the scale is an important issue here, because if you believe that consciousness and apparent conscious behavior and intelligent processes, like understanding and really responding in Chinese, 
are very complex. This rule book isn't a thousand pages. It's, it's a billion or a trillion pages. And it would take, if he's actually leafing through the book and making little notes, he'd be making billions of little notes. And it'd take you know, millions of years to answer questions. Uh, well, who's to say that that whole elaborate system isn't consciousness? It's basically describing a computer that is sufficiently complex to answer questions in Chinese. Well, by the very hypothesis, that system does understand Chinese. If it didn't understand Chinese, it wouldn't be able to answer the questions in Chinese. And it's not just looking up a set number of one, say, a thousand different questions. It can answer any question. That system, that rule book, that person following this, would have to actually understand Chinese. The person, the man in the Chinese room, is really just part of the system. It's really just the central processing unit, if you consider the whole thing to be a computer. If you have a computer that can understand Chinese and answer questions, the CPU doesn't understand Chinese. And so the whole scale of, of the system is, is one issue. And I, I've made the argument that you can use John Searle's own Chinese room argument to argue that the human brain has no understanding and no consciousness. Because after all, a neuron is just a machine. It's just following some rules. It's just shuffling neurotransmitters around, just the way John Searle says that this system is just shuffling symbols around. And, and, and John Searle agrees with that. Oh, yeah, a neuron's just a machine. Well, if that's true, then you put a bunch of neurons together, like 100 billion, and you get a brain. That, and if that brain has learned Chinese, it could answer questions in Chinese. It does understand Chinese. It does have consciousness. Uh, but really fundamentally, it's just shuffling around neurotransmitters, just the way uh, the John Charles Chinese room is shuffling around symbols. Just Where's the understanding? Uh, the same argument applies to the human brain. If you accept his notion that a system that's just shuffling things around, whether they be symbols or neurotransmitters, uh, doesn't really understand anything, well, then the human brain doesn't really understand anything. Are, are we differentiating between understanding and the subjective nature of consciousness? Well, John Searle uses the Chinese room to talk about both issues and to say that uh, a machine can't really have any true understanding. The human brains have some true understanding of Chinese, and machines are just shuffling around symbols and therefore can't really truly understand anything. But our brains are made up of neurons. Neurons just shuffle around, not symbols, but chemicals. and but somehow emerges from that is some deep understanding of some deep subject, like Chinese. And actually, what he's asking this machine, which consisting of the person in the book, to do is basically pass a Turing test in Chinese to be indistinguishable from someone who actually does understand Chinese. And he mixes in that then the issue of consciousness, saying, well, the machine obviously isn't conscious. This, this man has no understanding. It's just shuffling symbols around. How can we say that's a conscious system? Well, the same thing applies to the brain. It's just each neuron is just shuffling around some molecules. How can you say that has any understanding? The understanding comes from an unexpected place, a place that John Searle doesn't look, which is the emergent properties of this very complex system. And if you have a sufficient level of complexity that's organized in, in the right way, it can, the, the emergent capabilities are such that it can do very abstract, difficult tasks like answer question, arbitrary questions in Chinese. And if you believe that humans are conscious, it can be conscious. That's another emergent property if you accept that humans are conscious, which I do accept, but that's <laughs> a occasion. philosophical yeah. issue. But we're still back at that bifurcation between what is apparent consciousness, I call third-person consciousness, I'm judging the consciousness of something else, the Turing test, versus the internal, first-person, subjective, feeling of I know what it means to be aware and self-aware. If you limit yourself to science, which is objective observation, uh, then, you, then there is a difference because I observed some other entity. And I could observe that it's doing intelligent tasks, it's answering questions in an indistinguishable way from a human, so it passes the Turing test. That's an objective observation. Mm -hmm. But is, is it feeling something? I can't really experience that. I experience my own feelings. I don't. So uh, it's a philosophical issue. So if you ask me philosophically, you know, what is my philosophy? I say, yeah, I think 
other human beings are conscious and do have feelings. I mean, that is how we operate, but I accept that. Uh, but by extension, therefore, if a, hum if a machine uh, exhibits human level intelligence and therefore passes a Turing test, I will accept that it has feelings as well. Will you accept it or really believe it? Th that's the same thing. I will believe, <laughs> I, will, I will accept it uh, uh, just as I accept the consciousness and feelings of other humans. So you'd put me in the same category as this supercomputer that we will eventually have in terms of each of us will have the same level of other minds consciousness. Yes, and I think we will actually evolve into those types of entities because we're going to merge with our machines. That's a whole other topic. Sure. But yes, I don't think substrate really affects consciousness. We have information processes, computational-like processes. Yes, they're analog, yes, they're massively parallel, but they're information processes running in our brain. They happen to run on this biochemical substrate of, of neurons. You could run the same processes once we understand them on some other substrate, like a massively parallel computer. We will do that, I believe. And it doesn't matter that it's not running on a meat machine. It's running on uh, electronics or nanotubes. But if it's a similar kinds of processes, uh, if you believe that the human being is conscious, which I do, uh, we'll have to accept that for the non-biological systems as well.